We're going to look at the textbook translation exercises from Fuller and Choi chapter 8 on page 40 and we'll look at number 7 and number 8. Let's look at number 7 first. I'll read that. Lo avar Moshe Hayardain. Lo avar Moshe Hayardain. So we start out with lo and that is our negation particle and it's used here with a verb, although it can be used with other things as well, but it's often used with a verb. And so lo, not, and then we have avar, and with all the verbs we've seen so far, we have a third masculine singular perfect. In this case, we have an explicit subject, Moses. So here's our subject, here's our verb, and then the word avar, means to pass over. It can also mean to transgress, like to transgress a commandment. And context will tell us which meaning it will take, whether it means passing over something physically, like a river in this case, or transgressing, passing over a commandment. In this case we see Ha Yardain. Yardain is Jordan, meaning the Jordan River, and here it's acting as an object. We would expect the verb avar to have a direct object. So Moses passed over, or actually Moses did not pass over, the Jordan. And here we have a definite article, and it's the normal form of a definite article, a hay with a patach, and a doubling of the first letter of the word. In this case, the yod is the first letter of yardane, and it's got a dagish forte, it's doubled. That's the normal form of the definite article. Hey with the patak plus doubling of the first letter of the word that the article is attached to. So we have lo avar Moshe Hayardain. Moses did not pass over the Jordan. Okay, let's move on to number eight. Number eight is quite a bit like Genesis 1-1. In fact, we'll look at Genesis 1-1 when we get done with number eight just to compare the two and so we have a, a scripture verse to look at as well. Number eight is read this way. Asa Elohim et hashamayim v'et ha'aretz. Asa Elohim et hashamayim v'et ha'aretz. So our verb here is asa. And that is a perfect 3MS. Everything we've seen so far has been 3MS and an explicit subject, Elohim. Now Elohim is plural in form, and we'll find out why it is. This im ending actually is a plural, and the word Elohim can either mean gods, as in the gods of the nations, or it can mean God, as in the singular God of Israel. In this case, it's being used with a singular verb, and so pretty clearly the idea is God as in singular. So we have a word that is plural in form but singular in meaning and it actually goes with a singular verb. Asa means to do or to make. In this case the meaning make appears to be more likely. So we have God made. God is our explicit subject. And then we have a, an et here with a macafe, and so the et can be either the preposition with or it can be the marker of the direct object. And so et can be either one of those, and context usually tells us which it is. In this case, because we have the verb to make, we're looking for a direct object, and directly after the subject is where we would expect the direct object to be located and sure enough here it is. Sometimes there is ambiguity between whether et means with or whether it's a direct object marker. In this case and in most cases there's no ambiguity. We can tell one or the other. Here we have a direct object marker followed by hashamayim. Hashamayim. Here is our definite article. Hey patak. You see the doubling in the sheen here, Hashemayim, the heavens. So God made the heavens. Direct object marker tells us that we have our 
object here of the verb. So God made the heavens va'et ha'aretz. So here we have a second direct object going back to the same verb. So we have the one verb here, asa, and then we have two direct objects that relate back to that one verb. We have a second direct object marker, va'et, relating back to the same verb, ha'aretz, the earth. So God made the heavens and the earth. Note that normally when we have the et direct object marker, it goes with a definite noun. So we will have a definite article or a proper name. The noun itself will be definite. In this case we have a definite article and so we expect to see a direct object marker going with the definite noun. So to repeat, uh, Asa Elohim et Hashemayim va'et ha'aretz, God made the heavens and the earth. Finally, let's note some features of this last word here, ha'aretz. First we'll see that the definite article here, instead of the normal hey with a patach, has a comets, and that is because the aleph rejects doubling and causes the patak to lengthen to a comet. So we have ha-aretz. And then notice, normally, eretz is written with a pair of segols, like that, eretz. Eretz is one of a handful of words that when we put a definite article on it, the vowel in the first syllable changes, and so it becomes aretz instead of eretz. So we have ha-aretz. There's three other main words that do that, and they're mentioned in the textbook. Let's go ahead and look at Genesis 1.1, because it is very similar to the one we just looked at. So, we'll read this. Bereshit bara Elohim, et hashemayim va'et ha'aretz. Bereshit bara Elohim, et hashemayim va'et ha'aretz. The end looks very similar to what we just saw with minor differences that we'll talk about in a second. So we begin with Bereshit. Reshit is, see down here, it's a word that means beginning. It's related to the word Rosh, which means head. So Reshit is beginning. And the way that it's pointed here, notice the bait preposition, in by with. So in literally in a beginning, so there's no definite article here, the way that it's pointed. Reshit with a definite article would be ha reshit. The he for a definite article normally has a patach, but the resh rejects doubling, and so the vowel lengthens to a comets. Now when we add a bait preposition, if there was a definite article, it would be pointed ba reshit. With the bait displacing the he, but the comet's vowel for the article remaining. Bereshit does not have a definite article in Genesis 1.1, so how can it mean in the beginning? Reshit, without the article, can mean the beginning in places where there is no other beginning to compete with the beginning being addressed. So for instance, in Jeremiah 26.1, we have the exact same expression, Bereshit, talking about in the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, and clearly, we wouldn't say in a beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim. It's the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim because no other king began to reign then. So there's no other competitors. So similarly, in the beginning, when God did something, there's no other beginning to compete with it. So we would just say, in the beginning, bara Elohim. So here we have our verb, perfect 3MS, and then Elohim is our subject, God. Bara means to create. And so, in the beginning, God created, bara Elohim, eight Hashemayim, here's our direct object marker, related to Hashemayim, the heavens, God created the heavens, eight Ha'aretz, and the earth. So we have two direct object markers pointing to two direct objects relating back to our verb, bara. 
Note that the direct object marker is not connected to the direct object with a McCave. So we have two different forms that the direct object marker can take. It can be separate, standalone, or it can be connected with a McCave. Let me show you what that looks like. If it's written with a McCave, we have at, with a short vowel, at Hashemayim. In this bottom case, the McCave causes the accent to shift to the next word. This at loses its accent, and so now we have a closed, unaccented syllable, and so the vowel is short. In the above case, eight, because there's no McCave, this word with one syllable is accented, so we have a closed, accented syllable, and that's why the vowel is long. So with the McCave, we would have et Hashemayim. Without the McCave, we have eight Hashemayim. The meaning is identical. The direct object marker is functioning in exactly the same way. The only difference here is that the vowel is either long or short. So that is Genesis 1.1. Bereshit bara Elohim, eight Hashemayim, the eight Haaretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth.